Okay, we have a speaker pair this time, Steve Densley and Garrett Giles. Steve Densley is an attorney, but he's published several things, and uh, Garrett Giles is a psychologist, and you can read the bio on the website. And with this, I think you'll be really interested in their topic. So let me turn the time over to uh, Steve and Garrett. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, great to be here. Um, grateful, grateful to Dr. Giles for joining me and giving this presentation. Um, you know, I've been an attorney for 20 years, and uh, I've come to think that it's probably best for an attorney to bring a psychologist with them wherever they go. <laughs> so I appreciate Dr. Giles. We've we've uh, had a a good time, and, and it's uh, been very informative for both of us to prepare this presentation. Um, I've been coming to Fair Mormon conferences for many years, and um, we. My experience is, especially in this group, we probably all know people who have left the church. And for many of us, that's why we're here at this conference. We may want to find reasons to uh, maybe help people not leave the church, or reasons that maybe help them come back, or maybe we just want to understand why they left. And this experience for me started probably about 25 years ago where one of my longtime best friends left the church. This was a young man who had been married in the temple, who had gone on a mission, raised in the church, seminary graduate, and um, since that time there have been other friends, family members, uh, members of my immediate family who have left the church. And as a result, I've thought a lot about why. Tried to, tried to understand myself. Uh, you know, again, tr maybe trying to prevent disaffection from the church and others. Um, but at least trying to maintain relationships and gain understanding of what's going on. So in that process of trying to understand, I've studied probably hundreds of stories of people who have left the church. Um, I've spoken with, you know, my friends and family members. Um, and I've met with many therapists and researchers, and Dr. Giles is one of those, um, and in, through this process I've come to learn a lot of things and come to make a lot of connections that I think would be helpful to share with you. We'd like now to share some of those observations and I hope that having this kind of discussion can help us all to become better shepherds in general. We've come to understand that there are many factors that contribute to disaffection from the church. And we'll begin with a general discussion of the topic, but then we will focus on mental distress as one of the many factors that can contribute to disaffection from the church. And when we say mental or emotional distress, we tend to include not only mental illness, but also distress that maybe falls short of meeting all of the diagnostic criteria. You know, if you go through the DSM and start reading it, I, I was the social science reference librarian at BYU for a while, and I'd sit there in my spare time and kind of flip through the DSM and start thinking, well, I've got that one, and I've got that one. You know, you can have a lot of the different factors and maybe not meet the full criteria for a diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that you don't still experience some kind of mental or emotional distress. Okay, so it's, it's, it's probably something that all of us struggle with in one way or another regardless of whether we've been diagnosed. Now, mental distress is not the only and perhaps not even the predominant factor that contributes to disaffection from the church, but it's worth understanding the role it may play in the development of a faith crisis as we seek to lift one another's burdens. Disaffection from the church is not new. We know that before we even came to this earth, one third of our Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother's children rebelled and turned away from God. We can read throughout the scriptures of children of goodly parents who have turned away from God and deny their faith. But the reasons they do this are not always clear. In more recent times, we have been aware of those who have, among us who have drifted away. Growing up, you know, I had relatives or neighbors that uh, maybe stopped coming to church or, you know, I was aware that, you know, they kind of were drifting in the, in the perimeter. Uh, it maybe just seemed to have lost interest in religion, uh, maybe seemed to just like doing other things in, on Sunday. Um, and we may have attributed their disaffection to having been offended uh, or that they maybe they couldn't stop smoking or they really, really like the taste of coffee 
Or they may have just quietly stopped attending church, even though they had lost their faith for fear of becoming social outcasts in a large community with a lot of Mormons. So one thing that's different today is that there's a, there are a lot more ways for people to share their stories about why they left the church. The fact that there are new outlets for sharing these stories has perhaps emboldened people to be more open about their loss of faith. It's not hard to find a new community on the internet, a community of non-believers, a community with whom one can share one's story of disaffection from the church, and instead of shock, fear, and dismay, they encounter compassion, understanding, and encouragement. Therefore, in seeking to prevent disaffection from the church, it is more important now than ever that we extend compassion, understanding, and encouragement to those who express feelings of pain, doubt, and discouragement while they're still in the church. We must prepare to address the sincere crisis with compassion and truth. After all, if people who are experiencing a faith crisis find more compassion and comfort outside the church, then we're probably not doing what Jesus would do. Of course, some of the comfort offered outside the community of believers is a false comfort, and we should be clear about that. One thing that's often said by online critics is that church membership is in decline, and that even Marlon K. Jensen admitted that people are leaving in droves. However, it's not true that membership is in decline, or that Elder Jensen said people are leaving in droves. In fact, one people stayed, uh, what, one, once people started saying this, uh, it was reported in the Washington Post that Elder Jensen insisted that critics of the church were overstating the LDS exodus over church history. And he was quoted as saying, if I could get it to go to the next slide. What's the problem here? Trevor, help me out. what the slide would say if it came up. There we go. To say we are experiencing some titanic wave of apostasy is inaccurate. He is, however, concerned about people leaving the church and concerned about the, you know, troubling information people encounter on the internet. But uh, it, it really was misconstruing his words to say that he was saying that people are leaving in droves. In the face of growing membership roles for the church internationally, critics of the church claim that there's actually a wave of apostasy that's simply obscured in the church's official numbers since many people leave the church and do not remove their names from the roles. However, this speculation is refuted by the data. Attendance at other predominantly white Christian churches in America is in decline. But researchers have noted, I've got to go to the next slide, that there's little evidence to suggest that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is experiencing similar declines. While it is true that church growth in the United States has slowed, when Americans are asked what church they belong to, the same proportion of people, 1.9%, claimed they were Mormons in 2017 as they did in 2011. It's been reported that Christian millennials in general, not just Mormon millennials, are leaving in droves. It's therefore significant to note that Mormons are also much younger than other white Christian religious traditions. Nearly one quarter of Mormons, about 23%, are under the age of 30. Fewer than half, about 41%, are age 50 or older. In light of the fact that our church is younger than other churches, and yet it's not shrinking like other churches, it seems, that, as Mark Twain might say, that the rumors of the church's death are premature. Of course, reports that people are leaving in droves may help those who leave the church feel more confident in their decisions, especially as they join online communities. When someone close to you leaves the church, something shifts, something changes. The taboo that's associated with leaving is diminished. And the social prohibition that says that leaving the church is something shouldn't do fades too. Social media amplifies this because more people hear about it. As people feel supported in their decision to leave the church and emboldened in finding they're not alone and hear more about why they, we, we hear more about why they've left. And uh, there, there's, there's a bright side of that, of course, because as we hear more about why people are leaving, then we have an opportunity to understand and to prepare a wiser and more compassionate response and more effective ministry to those who are struggling. Now it can come as a surprise to those who have assumed that people only leave because they're engaged in serious sin uh, to hear that there are all variety of reasons why people leave. It may also come as a surprise to uh, have heard Elder Uchtdorf. 
he's got the magic hand. You, know, you can try to get to the next slide if, we, if uh, we're so lucky. I will read Elder Uchtdorf's quote for you. He says, sometimes we assume that it has been because they are, they've been offended, lazy, or sinful. Actually, it's not that simple. In fact, there's not just one reason that applies to the variety of situations. In fact, when the, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life asked over 2,800 Americans why they left their church, why they changed religion or stopped going to church entirely, they ran out of categories. There, there were so many, the answers were so varied that the analysts ran out of codes to categorize them. Discussions regarding loss of faith among Mormons commonly identify intellectual or social factors, such as troubling, troubling historical or doctrinal issues, or um, social or, or cultural factors such as feeling like they, uh, not feeling like they belonged among Mormons. Uh, or, or simply wanting to do other things with their time. Uh, people, there are people that literally just say that's, you know, it's not for them, they want to do something else. So there's not just one reason, but it's also true that for any one person, there are probably a complicated variety of factors that led to a, a disaffection from the church. In my personal experience of examining the stories of people who have left, I found that people often point to some incident that may have ignited a flame of discontent under them. That, and, and created some kind of severe emotional pain. And when the flame is not extinguished, they feel compelled to escape. So they, they may have identified one point of doctrine or episode of church history or a policy of the church. Some have acknowledged being offended by a church leader or other member. Some have reported that due to shame or guilt, they stayed away and found it difficult to return. And of course, there are other reasons. Unfortunately, believers can sometimes be dismissive of a doubter's pain. For every person who identifies one particular issue that led to their exit, there are many others who have encountered the same issue and decided to stay. Church apologists who are familiar with the arguments against the church and the responses to those arguments are sometimes guilty of exclaiming, they left because of that? That's just silly. Every member of the church has encountered difficult doctrinal or historical issues Every member of the church has been offended, and every member of the church has sinned. So when those, those of us stay, hear that somebody else left because of one of those other issues, it can be hard to understand, unless maybe we've personally struggled with that issue ourselves. And, and even then, we may conclude that we stayed, so they should too. Of course, some who have left the church find it difficult to understand how we can stay. They often assume that if we only knew what they knew, if we only saw that movie, or if we only read that letter, then we'd understand and, and, and we would leave as well. They're surprised to learn that some of us know everything they know and we've decided to stay anyway. And just as there are a variety of people, reasons people leave, there are a variety of reasons that we stay. We hope that the reasons we stay may help others to see how they too can stay. However, as we are always ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us, we should do so with gentleness and respect. We should not trivialize, demonize, or dismiss those who leave. We don't embrace the apostasy, of course, but we should seek to understand and love the lost sheep and where we can offer comfort and compassion. And I should add, I think Fair Mormon does a very good job of this. Whether one leaves or stays, a complex set of factors is involved. Once some incident ignites a flame of discontent, various other experiences can feed the flame. For example, a person who is disturbed by some item of history or doctrine may begin to find it harder to avoid taking offense at actions of church leaders and church policies. A person who feels overwhelmed by the demands of a religion that calls on us to be perfect may stumble upon upsetting religion or issues related to church doctrine or history and maybe feels relieved at the thought that maybe it's not true anyway. A variety of social, historical, doctrinal, spiritual, and intellectual factors combine so that if a person does not feel a way to douse the flame of discontent, they will feel compelled to escape. So along with social, historical, doctrinal, spiritual, intellectual factors, psychology may also play a prominent role in many cases. This concept first dawned on me as I searched for answers to the questions of why people close to me have been leaving the church. As I looked for common factors and, and, and among the stories that I've read, I started to notice that uh, 
people would commonly comment on mental illness that they were experiencing. They didn't usually draw any kind of connection. Um, it's been unusual to see anyone draw a connection between mental illness and disaffection from religion, but um, I began to explore the possible connection and started to find an emerging body of scientific literature that helps explain how depression and anxiety disorders can possibly contribute to disaffection from the church. Let's go to the next slide. Are you able to do that from there, Trevor? Tell you what, Trevor, when I go like this, you go to the next slide. All right. A 2015 survey conducted by Michelle Medeiros, a non-Mormon PhD candidate from Palo Alto University, found that more religious Mormons were more likely to report lower levels of obsessions and compulsions, and correspondingly, less religious Mormons were more likely to report higher levels of these traits. One could say that either OCD is causing a decrease in religiosity or a decrease in religiosity is causing an increase in OCD. However, as OCD has a strong biological component, it seems more likely that OCD may be causing a decrease in religiosity. Next slide. Scientists have also observed that there are major similarities in information processing between anxious and depressed patients. In both groups, maladaptive schemata systematically distort the processes involved in the perception, storage, and retrieval of information. Okay, next slide, Trevor. In other words, people with depression and anxiety see things differently and, and remember things differently. It's also been postulated that, let's go to the next slide, Probably, probably a battery problem is my guess. An anxious, anxious patient will be hypersensitive to any aspects of a situation that are potentially harmful, next slide, but will not respond to its benign or positive effects. There's plentiful evidence that anxious individuals selectively allocate processing resources to threatening rather than non-threatening stimuli. Go to the next slide. Next one. Non-anxious individuals, if anything, show the opposite kind of bias. Okay, keep clicking there. We've got a couple more bullet points. Maybe one more. Try one more, just for luck. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So that's a good list of uh, some of the research that we've been finding. To illustrate this point, two friends of mine who were married were burglarized on their way to church, or once they'd left a church. Somebody broke in, stole the jewelry of uh, uh, one of my uh, friends. Her husband had left the door unlocked as they went to church. Now, she ruminates on what may have happened if they had returned home. Uh, you know, to find a burglar there. It, it haunts her to think about, you know, they, they left, left this, this door open. Um, and despite his wife's distress, he still doesn't lock the doors and leaves windows open. Uh, by contrast, she locks the doors whenever possible. She even locks him out when he's out mowing the lawn. Okay, so they've experienced the exact same traumatizing situation and they respond to it very differently. Okay, let's go to the next slide. A substantial body of research exists that demonstrates that anxious people, whether they've been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder or whether they simply have an anxious disposition, are drawn to threatening information. They tend to dwell on threatening information longer than others, and they tend to interpret the information in a threatening way when the information is ambiguous. Whether they experience a social phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or generalized anxiety disorder, they have a harder time ignoring information they perceive as threatening. When the future is unclear, people who experience anxiety and depression tend to expect the negative and tend to expect the results to be more costly when compared to those who are not anxious or depressed. This research makes it easier to understand how two different people can experience the same information or the same situation and respond to it in very different ways. Consider how this may play out when encountering information regarding church history or policies or doctrine or ambiguous social situations. An anxious person will tend to focus on the threatening information, will tend to think about it longer. And when it's open to multiple interpretations, an anxious person will tend to interpret it in a more threatening way. 
If you are generally more likely to identify a situation as threatening and more likely to expect the results of the issue to be devastating, your experience with challenging issues at the church is more likely to be painful and harder to dismiss. For many of us, when we encounter church history or doctrine that's upsetting or hard to understand, we can find some relief by putting it on the shelf. We stop thinking about it and perhaps come back to it later when we have more information. However, for those who are anxious or depressed, they can find difficulty ignoring or forgetting the information. It's more difficult for them to divert their attention from it. For many people, they cannot just put it on the shelf and forget about it. Instead, they find that these threatening uh, ideas and concepts keep piling up. In light of this, it's interesting to note that many ex-Mormons, as they describe their leaving the church, talk about how their shelf broke. You know, they're putting so much stuff on the shelf. Uh, it's therefore important to ask how we can help unburden that shelf, how we can help strengthen that shelf, and when the shelf breaks, how we can help repair that shelf and clean up the shattered mess beneath it. In many instances, you don't need a scientific study to tell you that depression and anxiety can reduce church activity. If somebody's lying in bed most of the morning because they're depressed, that helps explain why they didn't come to church that morning. But we may wrongly assume that they've been offended or that they've lost their testimony without considering that the person may, be needed to, may, may need to be treated for depression. In the past, bishops may even have felt reluctant to refer somebody to a psychologist. However, the church now provides bishops with resources to address mental illness, and LDS.org even lists phone numbers that people can call for, for help. So as we minister to others and seek to build faith, it's important to recognize how mental distress can affect our experience at church. Inactivity due to mental health issues may spiral into a faith crisis. Faith comes by hearing the word. And faith grows as we nourish the seeds of faith. So faith may begin to wither and weaken when a person reduces activity in the church and isolates oneself from hearing the word. Anxiety and psychology probably impact church participation in significant numbers in ways that we may not have considered. Um, let's go to the next slide. Another interesting study. Oh, let's back up now. Where was that? Yeah, there we go. That one. Okay, now, now we'll... I'll explain why you saw that earlier. Another interesting study is being conducted by Jana Reese, who commissioned a survey of 541 former Mormons to determine why they left the church. She reports that among millennials, tied for first place among the reasons they left was that they felt judged or misunderstood. This is especially interesting in light of the fact that the defining feature of social anxiety disorder, sometimes called social phobia, is intense anxiety or fear of being judged, negatively evaluated or rejected in a social performance situation. Of course, all of us experiencing, you know, we, we all experience some concern over being judged by others, but when the concern starts to interfere with normal functioning, uh, this may have developed into a psychological disorder. This is a condition that affects approximately 15 million Americans and is the second most commonly diagnosed disorder following specific phobia, like being scared of spiders or something. The average age of onset for social anxiety disorder is during the teenage years, just the time when we notice that there are many of us that start uh, drifting away from the church. There are effective treatments for social anxiety disorders and therapies uh, and other means of treatment, but. Sadly, despite the availability of effective treatments, fewer than 5% of people with social anxiety disorder seek treatment in the year following the initial onset, and more than a third of people report symptoms for 10 or more years before seeking help. Let's go to the next slide. Our church expects us to be social. We're expected to speak. We're expected to pray. We're expected to teach lessons, read things aloud, answer questions in class, call people on phone, sometimes knock on doors. Knock on doors of strangers and ask them if they're willing to drastically change their lives. These are difficult things for anyone to do, but they can be simply impossible for someone who experiences social anxiety or social phobia. Somebody may be sitting in the lobby during sacrament meeting because they find it difficult to be in a room with a large group of people. Someone may go home after sacrament meeting because they simply feel worn out after being in a big group of people and they need to take a break. We may wrongfully assume that they've left because they have a weak testimony. And as a consequence, we may begin to treat such a person as someone who has maybe, uh, lack, maybe lacks faith or maybe who has repudiated us in our faith. 
so that we can start to, to feel like that uh, they've become an enemy. And if that person begins to experience a sense of rejection, they may further distance themselves from members of the church. They may seek out more supportive communities. Or tragically, they may simply suffer in isolation. It's not hard to imagine how this kind of separation from members of the church and church activity can ultimately result to a loss of testimony. Similarly, a person who turns down a request to pray in church or a request to give a talk may not have a lack of faith, but may simply fear speaking in public. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, glossophobia. Uh, this, uh, as a syndrome, social phobia is the third most common psychiatric disorder with an estimated lifetime prevalence rate of 17, 7 to 13%. The fear of public speaking, called glossophobia, where we sometimes call it stage fright, um, is believed to be the second most common phobia, affecting as many as 75% of the population. It's said that people are more scared of public speaking than they are of dying. So if you go to a funeral, most people would rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Someone who experiences maladaptive perfectionism or scrupulosity may feel overwhelmed with guilt and a painful sense of inadequacy as they listen to a speaker talk about how her family reads the scriptures together every day or how her life was changed by a ministering brother or ministering sister who came every month or how much she enjoys going to the temple every week. As others talk about how energized and uplifted they felt during the talk, a person with anxiety or depression may feel alone and scared and hopeless as they wonder whether they really belong in this church and whether they really want to go to a heaven where such things are expected. So let me share with you now one example of how mental distress can affect a faithful person and how wise leaders and family members can adapt the church's standardized ideals to meet the needs of individual circumstances. We all know that Steve Young did not serve a mission. I always assumed the reason he didn't serve a mission was because he wanted to develop his football career. And I've never faulted him for that because he's done a lot of good in the world. He's been a great example. And I think he's built a lot of faith through that example. But I was surprised recently to learn that he badly wanted to serve a mission. And the reason he didn't serve a mission had nothing to do with football. In fact, at the time he decided he was not going to serve a mission, he was the eighth string quarterback and had just been moved to defense. So he figured his football career was falling apart. So he, he went to his bishop and um, you know, told him he wanted to put in his papers. And then as he started thinking about being home, away from home for two years, he began to feel overwhelmed with anxiety. It had been so difficult for him just to travel to Provo from Salt Lake. He hadn't even unpacked his, during his first semester at school because it was just so difficult for him to be away from home. Once he came home for the Christmas break, he decided to talk to his bishop and tell him he, he could not go on a mission, and he felt terribly guilty about this. But as he told his bishop that he decided it was best for him to continue uh, going to BYU, his bishop told him about an impression that he had received a couple of weeks earlier, that Steve was going to visit him and tell him he planned to return to school. The bishop had received the impression that he should tell Steve that it was right for him to return to BYU. So instead of trying to talk him into going on a mission, the bishop told him to serve Jesus Christ, live your religion, and be a great example. And I think Steve Young has done that. It was not until he was 32 years old that he was finally diagnosed with separation anxiety. Steve Young had understanding parents, and a bishop who was open to receiving surprising revelation. It's not hard to imagine how under a different set of circumstances, Steve Young may have decided that it was easier to leave the church than it was to remain a member of the church that had expectations for him that he felt like he could not meet. As a church, we've gotten better at identifying these kinds of problems uh, and accommodating them. The process of applying for a mission call now includes considerations of mental health, and mission programs are adapted to the capabilities of faithful youth who struggle with mental health issues. Calls can be issued for shorter assignments and for assignments that are maybe closer to home, um, assignments that can be adapted to the needs of faithful individuals without imposing crushing challenges. Our church is learning to deploy a unique, uh, to deploy unique and faithful individuals uh, into appropriate ministries without assuming that every person is the same and must adapt to a standardized pattern. Likewise, I believe that apologists and ministering brothers and sisters can learn to adapt to the unique needs of people who are experiencing a faith crisis 
including a faith crisis with mental health components. Now, in, in, in introducing psychology as a factor that can contribute to disaffection from the church, we hope that we've made it very clear that we do not think that there's any one factor that causes a person to leave, including any one particular psychological factor. In other words, mental illness is only one factor that could create a vulnerability that could lead to disaffection from the church. Of course, like other factors mem mentioned, some people who struggle with mental Ill health issues leave and some people stay. Our point, of course, is that it may help those, with who, th those who experience mental health issues to stay if they receive proper treatment, if they were to consider new perspectives on history, practice, and doctrine, or if they receive the appropriate kinds of support from church leaders, from family members, from friends. So it is our hope in introducing this topic that we can encourage people to be more aware of mental illness issues and to seek help for themselves and others. A significant amount of research exists demonstrating that religion has a positive effect on mental health. Daniel K. Judd has found Trevor, can you help a guy out? Here we go. All right, Trevor, or, uh, Trevor's found that Daniel Judd said, the overall body of research from the early part of the 20th century to the present supports the conclusion that Latter-day Saints who live their lives consistent with the teachings of their faith experience greater well-being, increased marital and family stability, less delinquency, less depression, less anxiety, less suicide, and less substance abuse than those who do not. As Daniel Peterson explained in last year's Fair Mormon Conference, let's go to the next slide, regular church attendance is associated with a roughly 30% reduction in mortality over 16 years follow-up, a five-fold reduction in the likelihood of suicide, and a 30% reduction in the incidence of depression. This suggests that if a person struggles with mental illness, leaving the church would be counterproductive with respect to mental health. Yet it seems that some people who experience mental illness choose to disengage from church activity in response to struggles they experience, perhaps assuming that leaving the church will resolve their mental anxieties or depression. This response would not be unlike that of a woman I heard about recently who struggled with parking her car in a parking garage. She, she was simply not able to bring herself to do it. She was, she was scared the garage was going to collapse on her or something, and so she would park sometimes really far away from where she needed to be to avoid having to park into a parking garage. She started to seek treatment for this condition, for this phobia, and her life has become a lot more easy because now she can use that, that convenience that the rest of us enjoy. Similarly, if a person is distressed because of church activity, the answer would not be to stop going to church. Some may feel that, it, that, that the church is causing their anxiety or depression, but upon leaving, the mental illness doesn't leave. They've simply abandoned something that could have helped them. So the proper thing to do would be to seek treatment so the person is able to gain all of the social, intellectual, spiritual, and mental health benefits that come from church activity. In presenting these ideas, we do not mean to suggest that there are no issues of church history or doctrine that are confusing or upsetting, or that church members and church leaders never do anything that might be considered offensive. What we hope you will take away from this is that when someone with mental illness is faced with a challenging situation, there are things we can do as friends, family members, and church leaders to help. Of course, there are those who will say that we're stigmatizing those who leave and suggesting that we can dismiss those who leave as merely being crazy. We're not saying that. However, the only way to avoid the accusation would be to simply ignore the problem. If we were to ignore the fact that mental illness can make it difficult for some people to remain active in the church, we would be ignoring an opportunity and maybe shirking a duty to bear one another's burdens, to mourn with those who mourn and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. Just as there are a variety of reasons that people leave, there are a variety of reasons we can do, we, a variety of things we can do to help them to stay. So now I would like to turn to a discussion of some of the key features of mental distress that can affect church activity and what friends and family members and church leaders can do and the individuals themselves to respond to the challenges posed by mental illness. Okay, so as Steve has already said, what we're trying to do here is to raise awareness, to try to uh, uh, th put some information out there that will be useful uh, for better understanding how we can help. 
Um, so I want to cover some, some basic concepts first, uh, because there's no way to say exactly how to help in every situation. But hopefully with some, with some overall understanding of some concepts in terms of how mental distress tends to arrive with people, uh, that might be useful and helpful as, as we go forward. So in this section, we'll look at elements that, which contribute to mental distress, which may also block uh, religious belief and participation. And then we'll consider ways uh, the pe people can get help and how we can help other people who are uh, experiencing that distress. One way to understand emotional distress is to consider it through the lens of cognitive psychology, which is the basis of one of the most common evidence-based treatments and also one of the most effective. Cognitive therapy says that there's a link between what we think, how we feel, and what we do. Yeah, that worked. That's good. Uh, our thoughts affect our emotions, and our emotions affect our, our actions. Um, using this model, mental distress, which is uh, you know, characterized by the way we're feeling or the emotions we're having, uh, is viewed as being impacted by the way that we think. So uh, a number of distorted ways of thinking have been identified as contributing to major mental disorders, such as uh, major depressive disorder. Go on to the next one. As we will fully explain, the cognitive distortions that contribute to mental illness can also be seen as a barrier to belief and participation in religious activities. This illustration shows that uh, mental distress is built on mental distortions and then religious belief and participation may be negatively affected or blocked uh, by those distorted ways of thinking. For example, one common cognitive distortion is what we call all or nothing thinking. Go ahead. Uh, all or nothing thinking causes us to view the world in strict, mutually exclusive categories. So strict we can't show you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this way of thinking contributes to depressed mood because when one categorizes one experience as strictly perfect or ruined, that's the two choices you have, most of the time we're going to choose uh, the negative one, the ruined category, even if things are nearly perfect. It's either all or nothing because there's no in-between. An example uh, of that may be uh, you know, someone who has... Uh, who has uh, expected that everything in the gospel is going to make sense, and unless it does, then none of it is true. It's either all or nothing. Another common distortion is what we call overgeneralization. Overgeneralization causes people to view a single event as a never-ending pattern. This pattern often includes the words always, never. Uh, this way of thinking contributes to depressed mood by incorrectly concluding that experience has only been of one type while overlooking the aspects uh, the other aspects of, of an experience. A single event is not the same as a never-ending pattern, but overgeneralization would have you believe otherwise. This way of thinking may affect religious belief and participation by inaccurately assigning frequency to religious experience. For example, uh, when an answer to prayer is slow in coming, a person may conclude that they never get answers to prayers and may st st stop praying entirely. Mental filter is another common uh, cognitive distortion causing people to pick one aspect of a situation and make that the focus of their attention while ignoring and filtering out any other parts of that same experience. This way of thinking uh, contributes to depressed mood by only orienting to one aspect of the given situation and usually it's the negative or unfavorable aspect. Um, an example might be when a person focuses on one unkind thing that was said or done to them at church while uh, ignoring or filtering out the other uh, kind things that have been done to them there. There are other types of cognitive distortions, but the main point uh, that we want to make here is that mental distress is sometimes significantly fueled by cognitive distortions, and such a distorted thinking can also be a barrier to uh, religious belief and participation. Fundamental to mental distress related to anxiety is the idea of intolerance of uncertainty or fear of the unknown. Those who struggle with anxiety tend to have higher intolerance of anxiety, and that's manifest by persistent thoughts about the unknown of a particular situation. They, they pay attention to that because that's the thing that's threatening to them, but they, because it's unknown, they never get any conclusions. They never get, any, get anywhere. They just continue to get more and more anxious. Dwelling on the unknowns is a surefire way to increase anxious feelings. In other words, focusing on the unknowns rather than the knowns will create mental distress. In the words of the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne, he who fears he shall suffer 
already suffers what he fears. Anxiety may also arise when new information conflicts with old. This conflict may make it unclear about how to proceed um, and result in inconsistent thoughts, attitudes, or beliefs within the person. Such internal conflict is often referred to as cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance may cause us to choose from the following responses. We may, we may reject the, uh, the new information as false. We may consider the new information as unimportant. Uh, we may just suspend judgment on the new information uh, completely, put it on the shelf, kind of like what, uh, what Steve had said earlier, uh, or accept or reject the new information but with greater understanding of context and definitions, or we may just re re reject the old information entirely in favor of the new. Uh, for example, uh, uh, and we may do that because we're looking for relief. We're looking for some way to, to resolve the cognitive dissonance that we have because anxious people have really difficult times suspending that or prolonging that sense of dissonance. It's, it's, it's very uncomfortable and distressing to them. So, for example, uh, when faced with new information, uh, a person might, uh, might instead, of, uh, instead of taking the time to adjust one's former expectations about uh, what they expected from church history and doctrine, uh, they might just uh, decide that the church is no longer true in order to quickly resolve that anxiety or that conflict that they have within themselves. Besides creating depression or anxious mood, these distortions can also make it difficult to focus on the more subtle influence of what we call the still small voice, and thereby creating a sense of distance or isolation from God in communication with Him, which may be erroneously interpreted as, as that God isn't there or, or God doesn't care, uh, instead of uh, being more accurately seen as distorted thinking getting in the way of that relationship. In summary, then, cognitive distortions contribute to mental distress. Those distorted ways of thinking affect our mood. Cognitive distortions may also serve to understand the process of religious belief and participation by creating distorted ways of thinking which make it difficult for us to uh, process new information and, and reconcile it with the information that we already have. So let's move and talk a little bit about what people can do. Um, so when a person is experiencing mental distress, what can be done? Uh, how can that person be helped? In this section, we'll consider what can be done by the individual, by friends and family, by the church, and church leaders. And uh, finally, we'll talk about the prospect of professional help. It's useful to think about helping people with mental distress in three concentric circles. In the center is the self. Um, the responsibility for overcoming mental distress rests with the individual, ultimately. Uh, unless the individual is motivated and engaged, very little progress can be hoped for. Uh, but the, and the next concentric circle is that of family and friends. These are the people closest to the person in need. They're the ones that uh, who are most intimately connected to, uh, to the individual, who, and they have the most access to that person. And then next, there is the church. Church consists of neighbors and leaders who also know and love the individual, but may maybe not as intimately acquainted with the individual as the family and friends. So let's talk about the individual for a minute. Individuals can help themselves through adopting healthy practices. There's lots of research that suggests that uh, there are a number of things that people can do for themselves to positively influence their mental health. Uh, and those include exercise, uh, adequate rest, proper diet, and developing social connections. Additionally, uh, generosity and gratitude have also been felt to, found to be helpful in maintaining good mental health. So these healthy practices can be, can be performed right away with people who are, who are struggling. And uh, there may be some work to be done and some progress to be made and, and, and uh, areas to work on within these uh, self-help uh, categories. Next, let's talk about family and friends. They can help by knowing what to say and what not to say. They also having the right attitude toward mental illness and, uh, and helping those afflicted to make a plan of action. For the most part, uh, the things that should, they should say should be messages of, uh, of support and presence. Words can help or hurt. And here's a, few, a list of few words that, uh, that to say. We should say things like, I love you, and you're not alone in this. Uh, we should uh, offer to uh, our attention and our time. We're saying, we're saying I'm not going to abandon you, and wow, this, is, this must be so difficult, and I'm with you all the way. Now, sometimes 
people feel like that's too passive, that's not active enough, that's not effective enough or directive enough. Um, but that's where the mistake is often made with people knowing what to say. We want to fix it. We want to straighten them out. We want to show them the, the light. And so we say things, maybe, which we shouldn't say, like, you're just being selfish, or other people have it worse than you. You know, you, could choose, you have to choose to be happy. Uh, maybe you need to repent. I think that's what Job's friends said to him. And what about your child or spouse? You know, they're suffering too. You know, you need to snap out of this. Okay, all of those are self-serving statements. We want them to get better. We want them to change. We want them to improve. And maybe we think we want to be the ones to help them. That's why they're things not to say. Because oftentimes, when we do take that, that, uh, that effort to try to fix, has a, usually the unintended effect of making the person feel blamed and, uh, and shamed and maybe uh, feel like uh, they're wrong for having the struggle that they're having. Friends and family don't have to fix their loved one uh, or the situation they face, but they should uh, try to reassure and comfort. That's the best strategy. There's no way to list all the things you should say or not say or, or do with someone with emotional dis distress, but there are some attitudes to cultivate which, when followed, uh, will give you some ideas about what to do. Uh, emotional distress is a real thing, and depression and anxiety are legitimate medical conditions. So, so uh, uh, treating it as such is an important first step. If we were in a major auto accident, we might have bandages and bruises and casts and braces, and, uh, and that would verify or validate that we are actually injured. Emotional distress is different than that. There's n sometimes there's no outward signs. Um, but it's every bit as debilitating sometimes as a physical injury, a physical accident. So it's real. It's important to recognize that. It's also important to be patient with the person struggling with emotional distress and with the process of recovery and healing. There, there, there may be setbacks. That's common. Rarely is the, is the slope of improvement straight and perfect. It's up and down. And uh, factoring that in and anticipating that is important for those who want to be helpful to those who are struggling. Communication is also very important to develop and maintain understanding among those family and friends. Uh, feel free to ask questions and make observations with your loved one who's, who's struggling. Share your thoughts, share your feelings, and ask them to do the same. Have an open dialogue with them. Some days are going to be better than others for the person who's struggling and for yourself as someone who's, who's compassionately trying to, to be there for that person. And sharing and talking about that will be good for both of you. Asking them about their thoughts and feelings, you, know, you may be surprised about what they have to say and when they say it. Accommodation and adjustment are powerful ways to show support. Creative problem solving with humor and goodwill has the potential to say, I love you and I'm here for you. Um, and those can be very, very powerful for a person who's struggling and sometimes feels alone in their struggle. We wouldn't be helping very much if we allowed our loved one to avoid every distressing situation. But uh, if we're resourceful and, uh, and with good intention, we can help them make, meet the challenges of every day. Prior to meeting the challenges of every day is helping to, or part of meeting the challenges of every day is to help them develop a plan of action which includes education, self-care, and the use of available resources. Knowledge is power. And uh, becoming knowledgeable about the condition they find themselves in will help everyone know better what to do. So we want to ask, what do I need to know? And where can I go to find it? We live in an age where uh, there's lots of information out there and, uh, and there's, uh, we can find the information we're looking for, when, particularly when it comes to mental health. There's lots of great resources out there. Uh, Self-care has already been covered. We talked about it and, and, and so did Steve. But uh, that's essential to feeling better emotionally. Um, and so uh, we want to do things like uh, create those uh, basic building blocks consisting of rest and fuel and, and healthy habits. Those are important for, for being able to build good emotional health. We can't provide self-care for the loved one, but we might be able to find ways to support or encourage their efforts to do that for themselves. And then also, uh, we can help identify available resources that can be found through, uh, through family support, um, church leaders, and the priesthood, 
and then the blessings associated with temple worship. And then also we, there might be uh, resources available through health care. These are all areas that we can help them think through so that they can figure out uh, what they can do and how best to do it for themselves. And that empowers them as well. Next, uh, the church can uh, also help through the doctrines that exist in the church, the opportunities for activity through church service, and then also from shepherding from church leaders. These three areas contribute positively to alleviating mental distress. President Boyd K. Packer stated that true doctrine understood changes attitudes and behavior. President Packer lists two of the three elements that I mentioned earlier of cognitive psychology. Uh, he mentions uh, ch attitudes changing and behavior changing. We call that thoughts and actions. He calls it attitudes and behavior. Now, if attitudes and behavior can be changed by true doctrine, then it's reasonable to conclude that feelings also can be changed by doctrine. Some interesting research has been done that found that to be the case, that true doctrine does change feelings. Steve, uh, Steve uh, referred to some of this already, but uh, one study of LDS people found that uh, believing God is a loving God, which is a true doctrine, contributed to limiting or reducing anxious traits in those who held that fear. Um, or held that belief, sorry, that's not a fear. It was, uh, and that was, it was found that those who, uh, who hold the view that God is less loving or more controlling than was commonly taught by LDS doctrine were more likely to endorse more serious or frequent anxious traits. Uh, other research has found that increased views of the lovingness of God were most strongly related to reduction of emotional symptoms in LDS people. In other words, subscribing to the LDS doctrine that God is our Father and is perfectly loving appears to have the effect of reducing mental distress. Not surprising, but still good news. Uh, similarly, other researchers have found that, uh, that those who reported having an experience confirming the doctrine of God's grace, which we, had, we just talked about with Brad Wilcox, tremendous message there, talking about uh, favor and compassion as meanings of the word grace that the doctrine of God's grace is taught by the LDS Church has a positive relationship with the person's mental health. That means the more they believe that that was the way things were, grace uh, as, a, as a way that we relate to God, then uh, their mental health was better. Those who had more of a uh, legalistic view of God's de dealings with his children, that correlated with, with lower mental health. Go ahead, next slide. So this, this, uh, this graph I'm about to show you shows the stark difference between scores in shame, anxiety, and depression between LDS members who view God through a construct of works being the most important. We call that legalism. You're on your own. You're going to have to suffer the consequences sort of approach. That's legalism. Uh, and those who view grace as the most important. As you can see, those with the legalism outlook, that's the lighter bars, uh, have noticeably higher scores on the shame, anxiety, and depression scales that they used for this research than did members with the grace outlook. The grace outlook, their scores on shame, anxiety, and depression were lower in almost the same, the same amounts. That's, uh, yeah, that's research from, from Daniel Judd, which I think, which, which was in uh, educational, re religious education review uh, in October 2018. Um, these findings should come as no surprise to what, from what we just talked about and heard from, from Brad Wilcox. Uh, associating with the church also brings uh, opportunities for church activity. Activity in the church uh, brings social connection through serving others, teaching and learning from others, and working toward the common goal. Uh, as mentioned earlier, social connection also reduces mental distress. So activity in the church gives us opportunities in all those ways, which are, which are positively correlated with mental health. Uh, church leaders are in a position to make a powerful impact on those struggling with mental distress. Demonstrating compassion and the willingness to be attentive to the afflicted member being, can be a great comfort to the struggling member. As noted above, uh, helping them to develop a plan of action can be very helpful for them to, uh, to provide focus and motivation for their efforts. In addition, mobilizing ward resources may be appropriate. Uh, ward resources involve uh, the ward council, ministering brothers and sisters, ward specialists, and also uh, may, uh, may include uh, uh, the temporal resources of the ward and uh, inspired ecclesiastical counseling. As demonstrated earlier, 
As demonstrated earlier, the tr true doctrine changes attitudes and behavior, and there's evidence to, to say that it can alleviate mental distress. If that's true, then teaching the pure word of God could be seen as, an, as important medicine for those who are distressed, and for all of us, really. Uh, so when it comes to counseling from ecclesiastical leaders, uh, consider how many true doctrines there are to understand and, uh, and how they might change a person's functioning if they are better understood. That's an area of focus for ecclesiastical leaders. Sometimes the efforts of the individual and the support of family and friends and the church do not have sufficient impact on the emotional distress. When this is the case, it may be time to seek professional help. When a loved one is not responding sufficiently to the help offered, or they're not maintaining the progress that they have made, uh, it may be that the problem is of a psychological nature, and they require professional help. Uh, one way to think about the severity of one's loved one's symptoms is to consider the distress combined with the inability to control the symptoms combined with the frequency of the deep difficulties. And as those raise higher, that means the, se the severity is higher, and at some point that may be appropriate then to refer to professionals because this might be a psychological problem rather than uh, something that's, uh, that's, that's not. Um, for most of the mental disorders, uh, and the research is clear that uh, professional counseling is an effective treatment for depression and anxiety. Counseling medication appear to be equally uh, effective, but for some people, the combination of, of uh, of counseling and medicine might be more effective than if they were done separately. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which focuses on the link between our thoughts, feelings, and actions, is one of the most common evidence-based therapies for depression. It's also one of the most effective. Good job, cognitive behavioral therapy. In recent addresses, Elder Holland has discussed his struggle uh, with, with emotional distress. Clearly, the fact that one experiences anxiety and depression symptoms does not mean that one cannot fully participate or that one can significantly contribute in the church. Uh, he said, if things continue to be debilitating, seek the advice of reputable people with certified training, professional skills, and good values. Be honest with them about your history and your struggles. Prayerfully and responsibly consider the counsel they give and solutions they prescribe. If you had appendicitis, God would expect you to seek a priesthood blessing and, and then get the best medical help available. So too with emotional disorders. Our Father in Heaven expects us to use all of the marvelous gifts He has provided in this glorious dispensation. We've talked about mental distress and the potential it has to affect uh, religious beliefs and participation. Some interesting research has been done which suggests that the factors which produce depressive and anxious symptoms are also those that make it difficult to navigate conflicting information such as that about the church's history policies and doctrine. There are a number of things individuals can do for themselves when experiencing depressive or anxious symptoms, and there are things that friends, family, and church leaders can do for that individual as well. Sometimes professional help is needed to address the mental distress. We hope this presentation has been seen as a step forward uh, to more clearly understanding the factors that contribute to disaffection in the church and what can be done to help others and remain close to the church and to the uh, salvation found therein. Um, thank you for your attention. There's one for you. Okay. Uh, can you comment on how your findings relate to church members dealing with LGBTQ issues? Someone experiencing same-sex attraction. Um, I think the, the, uh, the, whether we're talking about um, uh, issues with, uh, with mental health uh, or issues with same-sex attraction, a number of things, I think that the, the, the the elements and the process is the same, for, particularly for family and friends. We want to be supportive, we want to be loving, and, uh, and we want to uh, better understand that person. Today we talked about some of the things that mentally 
might be going on for the person to create the anxiety and depressive symptoms that they have. Um, once we understand that better, we can be uh, more effective in our help. The same with any issues, whether they're mourning the loss of a child or whether they're struggling with substance abuse or they're struggling with, with uh, LGBTQ issues. Understanding where they're coming from, getting a view of where they're hung up, I think is an important first step. And so in a lot of ways, it's exactly the same. Please flesh out the response to the inevitable question. Steve Densley said ex-Mormons are all mentally ill. Okay, so my answer to that is, no, I didn't. We'll be publishing our remarks on the Fair Mormon website. We can refer people to that. Um, I tried to say in five or six different ways that that's not what I'm saying. So the point here is that mental illness is one component among many other different kinds of things that can contribute to disaffection from the church. And I would adamantly state there is no one thing that causes people to leave. And mental illness is not one thing that causes people to leave. It's one thing that may, in some situations, contribute to disaffection from the church. And it's important that we recognize that so that we can help people. We can reach out to people who are suffering and are burdened, and we can help lift those burdens. Thank you for asking that question, giving Steve a chance to respond. That's one of our biggest concerns, is that what we have said today might be misinterpreted as saying what was suggested. So thank you for asking that question. The question is, uh, is the decrease in missionary age increasing incidence of anxiety and depression in, mission, in the missionary force? I heard a mission medical advisor speculate that that might be the case. Well, when you consider what missionaries are asked to do, and the uh, amazing, incredible uh, challenges that, are, that missionaries face in, in the service that they're asked to render. And then you take them into that challenge a year earlier. Uh, developmentally, if we just talk about this in terms of, of human development, they're less ready, just developmentally, for that uh, uh, at, an, at an earlier age. That's just a fact. Now, one of the things that, that uh, President Monson said is that's the 18 would be the earliest people, young men could, could leave on a mission. They don't have to leave on their 18th birthday. That was never part of the message, but I think that's been uh, interpreted as, as the case. And so to be able to understand where our particular child is in terms of their development and preparation and readiness for doing what is a, uh, admittedly a very challenging uh, task, uh, we should do that more prayerfully and, and rely on the spirit, not just on the calendar. Um, so probably there's, there's more, our, our kids are more at risk because they're younger, but uh, uh, I don't know of any numbers that suggest that there's more anxiety and depression, but it, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, I'm going to hit two questions really quickly, and then there, there are so many really great questions. This is a really important topic. Um, Dr. Giles and I will stick around afterwards, and, and I'm sure some of you have some, some more uh, questions that we can try to answer personally. But um, the, the one question here that we, we almost went into, but it's such a huge topic that we didn't want it to distract from everything else, and that's suicide. So the question was, is why do you think Utah has the fifth highest suicide rate in the nation? Does this have anything to do with religion? There are some really important things and interesting things that came out recently and I'm trying to remember his name is a BYU professor that just published an op-ed piece I think in the Deseret News on this because Ellen DeGeneres said that people are killing themselves because of Mormon doctrine and it's not true there's no support for that um, it makes sense that you could draw this connection between people feeling like that there's a lot of things that they got to do in this church they can't live up to and so they're gonna kill themselves the data doesn't bear it out in fact if you, there, there was a, a survey done by the Utah, I think it's the Utah Department of Health, uh, where they tried to figure out why is it that Utah has such high suicide rates. And when you look at the data and correlate between, uh, you break it down by religion, those who are non-Mormons have higher suicide rates than the Mormons. Okay, now, uh, much suffering is caused when we create happiness to obedience. Will you address this? Will you address how we can handle this statement when said in a church setting? Um, in response to this, I, I hope that uh, you all listened to what Brad Wilcox said. I, I asked Scott to let us speak directly after Brad Wilcox for this reason. Um, it, it is a big problem that we sometimes get mixed up with our emphasis on obedience because it is important to be obedient. Obedience does bring us happiness, um, but we uh, should not feel like that if we're not strictly obedient that we've somehow, somehow are lost souls and that there's no hope for us. The hope is provided through the grace of Christ. 
and that the purpose of the obedience is not to try to figure out who is it that gets in and who doesn't. The purpose of commandments is to help us to understand how we can become Christ-like and how we can become more happy. Um, and Brad Wilcox has got a whole bunch of books out there on the table, and I'd, I'd refer them all to you. I think that they're great.